Right, hello evening everyone. Welcome to day 24 of Project Options Cashflow. This is Terence Tan over here and sharing with all of you how you can improve your trading and how you can use options as an investment tool to improve your portfolio performance. Okay, let's give some time for more people to stream in over here. All right, hi Uncle Fu, hi Gary, hi Josephine. All right, today it's going to be a special day, all right, because I have one of my mentors over here and coach coming in to share an important topic with all of you. Okay, all right, now, so we'll wait for more people to stream in over here before uh, we start the session proper, all right, and meanwhile, just uh, let me go through what is being shared in our Telegram channel for today okay now so the stock lingo for today is about bollinger band all right so what's a bollinger band okay, it is actually a technical analysis tool right that is defined by a set of trend lines that are plotted two standard deviations which is on top and below or positive and negatively away from a simple moving average of the uh, stock price or if you're trading futures then you'll be the futures price so whatever the asset price is Okay, now this can also be adjusted to the user's preference. Okay, now so basically it's uh, you know designed to allow investors to find better opportunities with higher probabilities in terms of identifying when an asset is actually oversold or overbought. So pretty much to sum things up, it's just a technical analysis indicator that you know people actually use to try and time the market. Okay. Uh, market started off the day negatively today right uh, as you know i've been coaching a group of tr live trading events all right that means a group of students who have been live trading with me over the last one week uh, i basically been mentioning to them day after day that you know markets are right now driven by headlines there's a lot of volatility that's going around so any one headline can move the market at any one moment so for today, the headlines is pretty much a rise in the coronavirus case in the U.S. again. So, you know, it causes a little bit of worries into the market right now today. So we are having a you know, negative opening or we are expecting a negative opening after a couple of bullish days in the market. Okay. Right, great. So we have a good number joining us right now. So um, for those of you who are joining us, right, do assist us with the standard drills as well. If you're not done so, click on the share button over here. Right, share out the videos that we have prepared for you today. Right, especially the topic that we have to share with all of you. Right, and right, allow us to reach out to more people. Right, uh, to help them better their investments over here. Okay, now. So uh, let me begin this session officially. Today is day 24 of our project options cash flow. Right? We have covered a lot of different strategies from buying strategies to option selling strategies and then even to how you can create portfolios using options as well. Right? So options is very dynamic. It can you know, fulfill short-term traders' needs. That means your day traders, your short-term traders. It can also fulfill long-term investors' needs as well. Okay, so today we're going to talk on the topic of how do you identify when an option is actually expensive or when it's actually deemed cheap when you trade it in the markets. Okay, so let me officially invite uh, one of my coaches right now, Jeremy. All right, so Jeremy, can you join us in the session? All right. Uh, all right. Okay, so Jeremy is joining Hi, us over here right buddy. now. All right, great. Now, so Jeremy, uh, maybe you can take it away. All right, so I'll leave you with the session while you know I'll be cutting in and out with uh, some ideas over here. Yeah. All right, go ahead, Jeremy. Sure. All right. Yeah. Thanks, Aaron. Yeah. Good evening, everybody. My name is Jeremy. I'm actually uh, one of the coach with IP uh, Investors to the community. Um, so basically, just a sell short introduction. I've been trading using Terrence strategy since uh, sometime September 2016. I've been doing uh, reasonably well. Um, and today, I'll be sharing uh, one concept that I personally really believe in, and I think it's very useful for everybody. So let me go to my slides here. Okay, so welcome everybody. Uh, it's part of the 
Project Options Cash Flow Series. All right. So today I actually will be doing on the uh, the volatility portion of option premiums. All right. So basically, we'll be touching into uh, the black source model in terms of like how do we understand uh, how uh, options premiums are actually priced. We will be going into the understanding the volatility in, in terms of impact as well as historical volatility of a the underlying as well as all the options. Uh, next, we're we'll going to jump trade applications as well as the core pros and cons of using the trade application. Now, um, as a warning before we start the session here, this is uh, during my days in university doing in volatility as well as the black scores model. This is actually a whole. A uh, whole lecture worth. We're looking at about three hours, four hours kind of lecture. So we're gonna do a very quick touch and go, and straight away into the trade application how we can use that. So um, it's gonna get a bit dry, but let me try and make it more interactive and easy for you to pick up in terms of how we can use it. Okay. So before I move on, right, uh, I'm just gonna share something that's very close to my heart. All right. So personally, I am a very big fan of the McDonald's as well as the Big Mac. So what I'll do is that I, whenever I travel, I get point that I will go to the country's McDonald's and I'll, I will definitely have a big Mac to see uh, how's it lying. I just want to have like understanding of the ambience of the, the, the restaurant itself. Now, uh, in having said that, whenever I go to a different country, right, um, I would like to observe the price of the big Mac because like maybe having understanding of this country's purchasing power parity. By that, what I mean is that what is the strength of this country's uh, economy? Um, how much are the people actually making versus how much do they need to spend on the same item which is the Big Mac? So actually, there's this item called, or rather this index called Big Mac Index. Basically, the Big Mac Index actually measures right the price of the same Big Mac across different countries in the world. And it's actually published daily, uh, or rather year annually right, for everybody. It's actually free. Okay, so uh, I'm just going to use the Big Mac Index as a way to, under, to make you understand how is this volatility going to apply for options trading. Okay, so for example, let's just take year 2000, 20, year 2000, okay? Now, based on the Big Mac Index, right, in the year 2000, in the United States, the price of the Big Mac is about 250, 251 plus minus, whereas for Singapore, right, in the same US dollar context, right, it's about 188. Now, well, let's move on to last year, 2019, for the same Big Mac index, for in the US, right, the Big Mac is gonna cost about five dollars and sixty-seven cents. Whereas the same uh for the same Big Mac in Singapore is gonna cost about four dollars and thirty eight cents. Now, using this Big Mac index, right, we're gonna have a very simple denominator. Let's compare the price of the same product in two different markets. Now, I don't need you to understand what is the Big Mac index in full. I don't really need to know how do we actually don't compute it, the history now. I just need you to understand for volatility which is the part of the next presentation think of it as the common denominator for us to compare premium premium prices across different market conditions and that's all that's all i need to take away from this okay so let's just dive straight in okay so the black skulls model um very dry okay it's actually a math model it's a math model that uh uses six variables to calculate the price of a very vanilla option All right so these six variables we're looking at what is the current stock price what is the expected dividends of the stock what is the strike price you're choosing what is the interest rate now in the market the time to expire for this option and the most important thing the expected volatility so all these six components right they make up to the options premiums that you and i will be trading uh, during the course of our journey now if you could look at this, right, um, frankly, as, as an undergraduate, when I was looking at the back scores models, was totally intimidating. It's like, what the hell is the lecturer talking about? <laughs> okay, so it's actually a six dimension chess, right, if you're looking at it, right? And, um, but we don't really have to do it because I, I think what, important, what is important is actually for you to understand what you can use. So rather than just look at it as a six dimension chess, six different variables, how can we actually uh, compare the options premiums right for different market conditions different companies right i just want you to ex to focus on volatility okay so volatility i've been talking about volatility what is volatility Seems like it. what is it okay so in this diagram you see as in this chart you see right there's a two different uh stock prices across the time frame okay this is stock prices across time frame okay um 
So for example, if you're looking at the stock price for the uh, the line that is actually depicted in black, you see that, okay, the fluctuations, the variation, the ups and downs are not so drastic compared to, you must use compared to, compared to the company in blue, depicted in blue lines. You see that the, the, the variation for the company depicted in blue lines right, has very much up and down swing. Okay, so I just need you to understand this. Volatility just means the ups and downs, the range, the how greatly it can swing from one point to the other point. And so, how do we actually use it? Now, whenever you look at volatility, even I sometimes will get confused, but just want to understand. Okay, so for volatility, there's two different types of volatility. We're looking at historical as well as implied. Okay, so what? Wow, historical implied. What does it mean? Just take it very simply. Historical, it just means happened already. It's the past. And we can actually see that. Whereas for implied, it is an expectation. It is what that might happen next. Okay, so you see words you can't really tell. I'm going to show you in my brain. Okay, so here. This is a chart of the SPX, or SMP 500 index. Uh, Whereas you see the area in green, okay, the area in green right, is actually the actual price right across uh, the time that the, the stock the, the, the index actually moves. Each side, if you see the red line that most of the time rests just nicely on top of the green area, that is the upper range of the Bollinger Band. Whereas for the purple line that you see, that is actually the low range, the Bollinger Band that we just went through today as the stalling girl today. Okay, now I need you to look through and observe. Okay, say this is based on the implied, that means the expectation move, the expected move of the S&P 500 index. How often do we actually see an area in green going higher than the red line. So if you see, look through, looking through this diagram, right, this, this chart, right, it doesn't really have much, much occurrences, okay? In fact, you can see that the small areas, let's try and do the, uh, okay. okay, so these small areas in black, right, underneath all the red lines, uh, these are the moments whereby after the actual movement happened, compared against the expected movement, you realize that the index actually didn't move as heavy as much as the expectations. Now, on the other side, that means on the downside, right? We compare the green area against the purple line. Okay? You'll find that there are not a lot of black spaces underneath the purple line. Okay, why well, I Jeremy is not going very weird lingo, you don't understand it. So let me put it in plain English. Very simply, the market consistently over projects both the upward and the downward movements. Again, uh, the market consistently over projects both upward and downward movements. That means for us to be an option seller, it's actually more advantageous to us because based on uh, the uh, the past occurrences of all these movements, right? It's always, or rather it's more often that the market actually didn't move as much as it expected to be. That means the options premiums are mostly overstated as compared to a fair value they have. Okay, so how do we actually use this? Okay. So I need to introduce a little bit of uh, different terminology here for you to pick up. Okay, now, the Trainers out there, what they might tell you is that, oh, implied volatility rank, implied volatility percentile, you need to know the difference. You need to know absolutely how it's determined for you to understand this. Now, they are right in certain sense, but in terms of trade application, I do need you to understand everything. I just need you to understand that implied volatility rank, or the IVR, or the I implied volatility percentile, both of them is just a way for you to gauge the implied volatility against the past 
52 weeks for the DP. Again, they are benchmark, they are measurement relative to the last 52 weeks for the DP. Okay, so basically they are like something like a, a rank or a percentage between the high and the low volatility for the last 52 weeks. Okay, so how do you use this? How do you use this? There are three different rules. Okay, the three different rules is a permutation of the last two pointers, the last two bullet points that I mentioned. The best case scenario, which doesn't happen often, and you should really consider to do the trade if you really see this, is number one, first criteria, the S&P 500. ETF. Let's just use the ETF SPY. Implied volatility is actually or the implied volatility rank or the percentile is more than fifty percent currently. First criteria. Similarly, in the first condition, the second criteria, you need the company or the counter that you're trading to have a volatility by by volatility rank IPR or IP percentile. I'm just gonna call that implied volatility. Okay. Implied volatility that is even higher than the SPY that you have. So first criteria is the SPY must be more than 50%. The company that you're trading must be more than the SPY. What this means is, okay, SPY is already very freaked out now. Then the company is even more freaked out than the SPY. So you expect that the option premium is going to be very, very inflated and it's going to give you a lot of cushion and room for be wrong. All right. So coupled with other factors, other things, be it technical, be it fundamentals, you're gonna have a very good chance for you to be profitable in the trades. Okay. The second, the second scenario. Okay. Why I have the second scenario is because the first scenario doesn't happen very often. It's going to wait only for the first scenario to take a trade, right? Then you're really, really gonna be a very, very passive trader or investor. Okay, so for the second criteria, what we need is when the company, the company or the counter you're trading has an implied volatility of more than 50%. Okay, so the second scenario is the implied volatility of the company you're trading has more is more than 50%. That means this volatility now you're trading, this company's volatility now is actually more than more than uh, the the median the, the half of the last 52 weeks volatility i need to say is actually more expensive than not compared to the last 52 weeks ah, then this happened more often if you do a screen on uh, your platform or you use a different range of different stock screeners right you can actually have a a, a a short list that actually shows up all this screening very often now the having said that right in the in the very big long bull run that we had since 2009 until uh sometime the end of last year when it kind of like broke broke or not that one up to debate after me okay um you don't really get this often as well uh, or often not this when you get this 50 percent more than 50 percent in of duty for the company right it means that this company is very very likely to go bust sometimes you see this you don't even dare to trade Okay, that was, so there's a third scenario. There's a third scenario account for this. Very simply, the implied volatility for the company has to be greater than the implied volatility of the S and Fire ETF, SPY. Now, I didn't need you to visualize this. Today, the SPY is trading, for example, uh, with an implied volatility of 25%. Now, let's just take maybe another comp uh, company that, uh, for example, Spotify. So let's say Spotify is trading at implied volatility of say 30%. Okay. Let's not go into the details of how is IVR, high IV percentile count. I just want you to understand between 25% to 30%, Spotify has a 5% kind of like more expensive premiums than the market, than the benchmark, which is the SPY. Now I'm going to go into a very life example. Uh, before that, let me show you. Where can you see from your trading platform? Where do where's this IVR? Where's this IV percentile? Okay, now I'll start with the Tasty Trade platform. Okay, when you log into the Tasty Trade platform, this is for Luckin, one of the company that almost or uh, going past soon, maybe. Okay, if you see right beside the counter window, there's this IV rank. Okay, 
So this is where you can actually look out for the IV rank. So you use and compare against the SBY, the IV rank. So in this scenario, Larkin is at an IV rank of 54.7. It fits the, it doesn't, it fits the criteria, but it's more than 50% IV rank. Can consider, can look at it. Now compare against the SBY. SBY isn't more than 50% in terms of IV rank. So we are not looking at the first scenario whereby both SBY and then the company, the Larkin, is more than 50%. So not first scenario. Like I said, first scenario doesn't happen very often. Okay. Second scenario. This is the second scenario situation whereby the company, Larkin, is more than 50%, as well as, as the third scenario, is more than SPY in terms of its IV rank. Okay. So for those of you who are using Tinkerstream platform, how do you actually look out for the uh, IV details? How do you do that? I need you to go to your trade tab. Now under that, there's this two days option statistics. Let me zoom this up. Click in there. What you will get is this. It looks like this. Okay. I need you to see the current IV percentile. That is the IV that I'm just talking about, the whole whole last 20, 30 minutes. Okay. So this is for Spotify. Now, just driving you back an example. Okay. Using the Tinker Stream platform, right, there's actually a way that I can analyze, right, what is the effect of this IV on the, the, the premiums or the options that you're selling. Okay. So I'm going to use Spotify. Okay. This was taken sometime on Sunday. Okay. Uh, before the opening bell on Monday of Thursday. Okay. So the two price, this one on the left is the uh, adjusted price after we taking into account that if let's say for TV is around, I'll say around estimated around 50 percentile. Okay. Whereas the mark price is the percentile for the Spotify in terms of this premium, the premium at the current level TV. Okay. So if I recall correctly, right, Spotify was at about 57 percentile in terms of this impact of TV. Okay. So I show you numbers, right? But some of us who are not very fast in calculation, they really cannot understand right? why am I trying to say okay, I give you calculation. Okay, you see, yeah. So for the Spotify 17 July, $195 put, just to put itself at 57% down for the IVR, the implied quality view. It has a mark price of about $2.92. Okay. Whereas if I adjust it to the tail price, through the tail price, at about around 50% now IPR, the same option only has a price of $2.17. Okay, so let's say if $2.17 is 100%, right? It means uh, at the current, or when the screenshot was taken on Sunday, the premiums for the same option is actually more expensive by 34%. So same option, different in price volatility. You're gonna get a significantly higher now I'm just gonna ask you, right? If let's say you're gonna sell a product, are you gonna, are you gonna sell it when it's more expensive or are you gonna sell it when it's dirt cheap? I think most rational people will sell it when it's more expensive. And that's the whole basis of the next sharing. So now going to pros and cons of using IV, impact volatility as a trading uh, kind of a benchmark or a measure, right? Now I need you to very pay very much attention to this. The IV, the impact volatility, it only helps to quantify market sentiment. That means it is like, I give you a number. Today you can see how scared is the market. Uh, it's something like the mix. Okay. And uh, it allows us to do this very advanced glance. Okay. How, be, how much scared are people of uh, in terms of this company? In the example of Spotify. Okay. Using the IV, right? If you go and go more advanced, you can actually determine trading strategy and activity. Are you gonna buy when it's cheap? Are you gonna sell when it's expensive? Are you gonna do a combination of them across different time span? The, the choices, the permutations are not, not restrained. It's up to how you how good you are, how creative and how skilled you are in terms of options uh, strategies. Now moving in the cons, right? IV as a measurement, it only takes into account price. 
it doesn't think in account technicals, it doesn't think in account fundamentals. So you're gonna have to see a lot of times when these companies are high in IV, right? They are really, really being stressed in terms of their financials, in terms of market events. So pay very, very uh, strong attention to whether you are willing to trade the company and it really needs to right uh, how you're gonna man how you're gonna manage the trade have an exit plan first also for ib it only predicts movement why well, doesn't give you direction though so if let's say i have a very high ib it can go even down by i mean i expected it can go even much lower at my expectations or can be very high bouncing very high by expectations so IV is not a way for you to predict movement. I need you to understand this. IV doesn't predict movement. It's just an expectation of the magnitude of such a movement. Okay. So actually with that, right, I'm actually done for tonight sharing. All right, no problem. Uh, thank any you very much, Jeremy. Jeremy? Yeah. Uh, meanwhile, if any of you have any questions, uh, please start uh, posting them out in the comments while, you know, I'll start shooting Jeremy some questions when it comes to volatility as well. Okay. Uh, so Jeremy, you mentioned that basically volatility doesn't point towards a certain direction. Yes. Okay. Now, so that, that also means that, you know, when there is a higher volatility, uh, it basically, or, you know, you mentioned that when there's higher volatility, option premiums are, get inflated, basically. Yes. And it will also mean that both call options as well as put options get inflated at the same time. Yes. Okay. Now, that's one of the reasons why Jeremy basically said it doesn't give you a direction, right? It just tells you that there is some fear or some reason for a fear in the market. Right, and the market is basically expecting because of this reason a much bigger move from the underlying stock. Okay, uh, Jeremy, I'm just gonna cut in over here and share a little bit of my screen. Okay, uh, to kind of highlight sure. a little bit of what I said yesterday. Okay, all right now, so I just swapped over the screen from Jeremy. Uh, so yesterday I mentioned this about uh, comparing between two different stocks. So if all of you remember. Uh, we are comparing between this company called Corning Inc., all right, versus uh, another company called uh, Lazy Boy, all right. Okay, now, so you would realize that both stocks, all right, both stocks have prices that are very similar. All of them are sitting around the twenty-seven dollars mark, all right. But if you look at uh, Lazy Boy over here, uh, where Jeremy mentioned it has an implied volatility of about seventy-four percent. All right, and let me go to uh, what Jeremy said. Uh, the current IV rank is way over 53%. Okay, all right, now, so uh, this means that basically premiums for Lazy Boy is it's inflated. All right, okay, now, so what do I mean when I say inflated? Now, take a look at this. That means if I were to do what I call, um, how do I say this? Uh, take uh, what I call add the money, okay, that means it to kind of calculate the movement or an estimated move that the market can make, right? What you just need to do is to take an option strike that is at the money, okay? At the money over here, okay? Now, so uh, if we take Lazy Boy, that means if we take uh, 25 over here, all right, 25 strike, okay? We just take the call option premium, which is somewhere around 370, all right, which is the last traded price. Okay, and then you take the last traded price of the put option, which is 90 cents. Okay, so if you take 370 plus 90 cents, right, you get kind of like a $4.60 expected move. Okay, all right, now, so that's actually what the option pricing is actually trying to tell you. It's trying to tell you that the market actually expects kind of the stock to go up or down by $4.60 over here. Okay, now, but if I were to hop over to uh, GLW, Okay, all right, GLW. Now, for the same option over here, all right, for the same option, you realize that the implied volatility is much lower. It's only sitting around 42%, all right, sitting around 42%. Let me just take a look at, uh, IB rank is the same, all right, now, so, um, sorry, let me get that back, right? Okay, now, but because the implied volatility, which is the current one, is much lower, all right, than the other one, okay, what you see right here now, is that uh, if I take an add the money option, all right, I am expecting around a one dollar seventeen uh, premium from the call option, which is add the money, all right, plus about another one dollar thirteen from the put option, 
So if I add both of these together, right, that would give me an expected move of around two dollars thirty cents, right? So can you see how implied volatility starts to tell you a little bit about what the market expectations of the move actually is, All right? So it basically expects the market to move by a bigger percentage, All right? So uh, that's what a implied volatility does. So while Jeremy said over here, it doesn't really exactly tell you the direction but it just tells you that the market is expecting a much bigger move. Yes. Okay, Jer Jeremy, anything to add on to this? Mm, I think in this case, I just want to highlight that the study of implied volatility is actually a very deep school of thought in terms of option yes, trading. Yes, don't, don't get too deep into it. Yeah. All right, okay, don't get too deep into it because uh, you just need to take it from a more simple approach. Like uh, basically what I said yesterday, if you are a buyer of an option, all right, if you are a buyer of an option, all right, uh, what you need to expect over here is this. When you're buying a particular option, be it a call or a put option, all right, during a high volatility period, that means a high implied volatility, all right, you better be sure that your targeted move from the start, all right, it's going to be bigger than what the options are indicating to you. Right, that means like for lazy boy over here, we saw that the market is expecting around a four dollar movement up or down. It doesn't matter, right? But let's say if you're uh, you know buying a put option because you expect it to go down, right? You better make sure that you expect your expectations or your target price on lazy boy, right? It's you know a target price that is four dollars lower if you're buying a put option, right? Because if it's anywhere less than that, that means by buying the put option, right, you may not be able to be profitable at the end of the day. Right, because if you buy, you know, an option that expects a four dollar move in order to profit, but you know the stock only drops by two dollars, for example, you're still not going to win at the end of the day. Okay, all right now, and you know that's also assuming that you know whatever event that may happen, uh, you know, if it happens over here, uh, after after the particular event becomes a fact, all right, what's going to happen is the implied volatility is actually going to drop. All right, and when implied volatility drops, it also causes the option premium to drop. So what you also did over here was you bought something that's expensive, right? But maybe a couple of days later, it suddenly became cheap again. So you realize if you are a buyer over here, it's a disadvantage to you because you have paid you know a much higher premium price to buy a particular bet, all right? Okay, but you know just two days later, the bet became a cheap bet after that. All right, so just because of the volatility strength that we call it over here, right, you would actually already be looking at some losses, right? Even if the stock moved in your favor, right, just because the option became cheap due to volatility. So you know, uh, this is where Jeremy mentioned, you know, when the volatility is high, right, it will actually aid the option sellers, uh, or in a way, it's more advantage the option sellers. But at the same time, when the volatility is high, that means the market is basically expecting something to happen on that stock itself. So, you know, you do have to pay attention to what are the events, what are the causes of the spike in volatility. Is it just the overall market, right? That means usually when the overall market collapsed, uh, for example, say like last Thursday when the S&P 500 collapsed, uh, was it last Thursday or two Thursdays ago? I can't remember when the Fed meeting was announced. Uh, okay, so it caused the market to collapse by 7% in a day, right? That would cause implied volatility to spike, all right? Now, so if, you know, that moment itself, you were to sell options, all you needed to be sure about was the fundamentals behind the company, right? And support levels or support prices of those stocks itself. Right. But, you know, uh, events like earnings, events like product launches, events like uh, a special announcement by the company, right, that can also cause implied volatility to spike because uh, what people call this is basically a binary event. Right? So a binary event is where people cannot expect the outcome. It can swing either way. So the only way to price this into the picture is to increase uh, the premiums of options. Right, That's how market makers basically uh, used to protect themselves. Uh, think about it this way. Think about it this, this way. Um, if a money changer, a particular money changer, all right, realizes that a particular currency over here is so popular that he's running short of supply, 
All right now, so what he's going to do over here is if he realizes that, right, he's going to try to increase his profitability from, you know, whatever remaining stock he has left uh, for that day. So, you know, what he's going to do is he's going to probably widen up his buy and sell prices for that particular currency itself, just to try and increase the profitability of it. Okay, why? Because he kind of knew that, you know, it's kind of in demand over here. All right, so this demand is basically an expectation of the stock price movement. So if the market tells uh, you know, everyone that I expect the stock to move by a lot more, all right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to make the option prices a little bit more costly. Yeah, okay. All right, so you, know, you basically try to weigh it out of a risk versus reward in this context over here. All right, uh, the wider movement, what are the causes of it? What's the implication of it? Uh, if it's not so severe and not so serious over here, then if you're an option seller, you can still continue to sell expensive options. Because you know you ex you you are basically aware of what the risk is, right? And you're just taking advantage of the mispricing over here because you are clear of what your expectations and what your wants are. Okay, all right. Okay, back to you, Jeremy. Anything to add on? Hmm. I think in terms of the trading, right? Uh, as a as a sharing, in terms of my experience using this, right? Uh. Hmm. I'm gonna tell I'm gonna tell you this very upfront. If any of you guys are gonna decide that you're gonna trade purely or very closely just following the implied volatility, right? It is very frustrating to do so. Now yeah. let me explain to you why. You're gonna have nights, right, that you're hunting for the counters and then you're like, oh, there's nothing that really, really fits my criteria. And then maybe once in a while you get a handful of counters that you can look at, and then when you open up, you're like, oh the you know, first spread is the is too wide, I'm not gonna be able to trade it. Or when you see such a counter, the company is really, really, really bad in terms of the technicals, the fundamentals. So like for example, um when you see for example like a, a company like Larkin happens to open up on a like or three trade. Now, how many of us will actually have the method to actually take this trade? Now, uh, that being said, right, so if we focus, I mean, at LMP here, what we do is we focus on very good, uh, very solid companies with proven track record. And you could structure a trade and be patient enough to stick to a strategy whereby if you're going to be right, you're going to be paid off very well because you're selling very inflated premiums. Whereas if you're going to be wrong, you have a way to fix your repairs, which and most of us in the community know how to do it. Yeah, so doing that actually gives you an edge compared to the other people who maybe is just buying options to benefit from the upstream, downstream, within this two months period of time. Yes, they're gonna make a lot of money, but is it gonna be something that can consistently pay them in the next five years, 10 years, 20 years? Frankly, I don't know, but I believe what I do now can pay me for the rest of my lifetime. Okay, now, uh, I think for everyone, uh, in case you're not part of our community, what Jeremy is just trying to say, it's a choice between being a buyer of an option or being a seller of an option for cash flow over here, right? Because in our community, I'm Possible Investors, uh, we are mainly portfolio, once again, let me say this, we are portfolio-driven option sellers, which means uh, we are looking for great stocks, uh, but we are capitalizing and making money from these stocks by selling options. Right, so uh, I think the best way to sum today's topic up is really this. Um, think of volatility right, as uh, an add-on, right, an add-on. Uh, like what Jeremy just said over here, nobody, you know, like for example, nobody probably would trade uh, a stock just on using, for example, say, uh, oh, let's just use the indicator I used today. Nobody trades, uh, for example, a particular stock just using Bollinger Band, Bollinger Band by itself, right? You know, Bollinger Band is just kind of like a confirmation over here with a thesis that, you know, the trader probably already has formed in his mind itself, all right? So, you know, you can't use it as a standalone. It should be just something that is additional, right, before you actually execute the trade or make the trade decision, okay? Now, so um, if you're option sellers, the first decision will still have to be the fundamentals behind the stock. Second decision will probably be, you know, where's the support level? You know, how are you choosing your sell strike price over here? 
All right, and then maybe you want to determine, all right, right now when I choose these options, is you know, is it considered expensive? Is the volatility high, or you know, it's on the cheaper end over here where the volatility is low? All right now, how does this def defer over here? All right now, let me just add on a tip over here. All right, anybody wants anybody wants a tip if you're an option seller? All right, okay, anybody wants a tip if you're an option seller over here? Right, okay, now that means what's the difference? All right, uh, in terms of strategy, you should apply when market is in high volatility. Right, versus a market when it is low volatility. Okay, all right. If you do over here, type I do, okay? All right, leave a comment, I do. <laughs> all right, leave a comment, I do, I do. Okay, all right, I do over here, right? And then I'll, I'll, I'll share it with you. Okay, there has to be a learning point out of everyday session, right? Okay, so since today it's uh, about topics over here on volatility, all right? So, all right, uh, I'll share with you, okay? That means when you're seeing a high volatility, all right, on a fundamental stock that you know you're happy with and then you have already picked up a strong support level where you have decided okay i'm gonna sell my you know option over there at that strike price okay now so uh how does a high volatility environment differs in terms of your strategy strategy decision versus a low volatility environment okay all right now <laughs> right now so jeremy was basically uh you know kind of Hinting to me, did, did I just make everyone fall asleep over here? I, I, you know, I'm doing this to prove to him that, you know, they, they're, they're, they're listening. Don't worry. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So, so I'm proven right over here. <laughs> All right. Okay. Now, so this is correct then. Jeremy, don't worry. Everybody's still around. Okay. Everybody's just listening intensively. Okay. Now, so the difference is this. The difference is this. Uh, when markets are in high volatility. Okay. When markets are in high volatility. Um, let me do this. Okay, let me let me share my let me share my screen again. Okay, let me get the period right. Okay, and then let me share my screen. Uh, give me give me a short moment. Uh, Alright, give me a couple of minutes while I get the screen set up before. I show you what I want to show you guys, okay? So let me show this to all of you now. Okay, now, so if all of you can see again, uh, let me just cancel both of us out so you can see the screen. Now, so what I'm showing you over here is just this particular stock called MGM Resorts. Okay, so, you know, if any of you are into the casino scene or, you know, you have ever heard of it before or you've traveled to Las Vegas before, you've probably heard of MGM Resorts. Now, so I'm bring the date back to March 23rd this year, right? So everyone should be aware of what happened uh, during March itself. The market crashed because of coronavirus. Now, so on such a big crash like what it did in March, right, you, you can safely bet that all stocks, every single stock will have absurd, absurd implied volatility, right? So you can see over here on the right corner over here, right, you have, you know, options that expire in four days, options that expires in 11 days, with implied volatility that's like 300%, all right, 300%. How is it different, all right? How is it different? Let me show you right now. Okay, if I were to do MGM right now, all right, this is today, all right? Okay, so this is today. If we look at a similar option, all right, where, you know, it's like two days to expire, eight days to expire, can you see the implied volatility is like one third, all right, one third of it, okay, all right, now, so, Back in March, because of the overall market risk that we're looking at, okay, we are seeing 350%, right? 350% volatility, right? And right now, because, you know, markets are high all over again, markets rebounded, the volatility on this stock has dropped to like 90%. Okay, now what's the difference, right? The difference is basically this, okay? Where markets have high volatility, right? It means that every single option that is being sold right gets inflated gets expensive right so the right strategy to be adopting during those period of time 
the right strategies to be adopting during those period of times, all right, if you are if you are like us, okay, a portfolio option seller, all right, the right strategy to be adopting, okay, is actually what we call a naked put. All right, so when volatility is high, options are priced expensive. Okay, all right, and you are a portfolio option seller, which means you don't mind holding on or buying those stocks if anything is wrong. Okay, what you should be doing is you should be looking to sell all right, what we call all right, naked puts. Okay, all right, now, if you remember during our project options cash flow, selling naked puts, you get paid, all right, you get paid to take on an obligation to buy the stock, all right, to buy the stock. Now, so can you see for like four days over here? I could sell like a $6 put option and still get paid around 13 cents for selling that option, right? 13 cents for selling that option. With a stock that's sitting at $9, all right, expecting it to drop, all right, to $6 over here, all right, expecting it to drop to $6 in three days, uh, in four days' time, all right, it's as good as me saying that I expect the stock to drop by another 33%, all right, 33%. Why do I say this is great? I say this is great because if you believe in this particular stock, that should be the first judgment call, right? If you, be, if you believe in this particular stock, then you would see that, okay, the stock has actually fell. It actually fell from a high of $33, right? Okay, $33 all the way down, right, to $9 where we are seeing it now. That means the stock has already fell by over 60%, all right? By the time you're looking at it, it has already fallen by 60%. Now, if it is a company that you're willing to buy, that means usually you believe in the fundamentals of the company. You don't believe that the company is going to go bust. Okay, now, so in that case over here, right, throwing a challenge right, to a customer right, and telling the customer, hey, I'm willing to buy your stock right, in four days' time in the event that it drops a further 33% over here. All right, now, can you imagine why I say this is an absolute bargain? Right, because if you're trying to make the same 13 cents right now, let's just take a look today. If you're trying to make the same 13 cents, right, you would see this, right? For the 13 cents over here, you, you can only go as far as 16.50. Right now, and the stock today is sitting at about 17.50. That means right, the stock can only fall by a dollar. Right? The stock can only fall by a dollar over here. Right? Now, so you realize that your margin of safety is much lesser, much thinner, all right, when the volatility is low. Okay, all right, now, so when volatilities are high, the right strategy to be adopting is actually if, you know, you have the capital, all right, is to sell naked puts. All right, now, what about when volatility is low then, or lower, like right now, okay? When volatility is lower, like right now, your choice of strategy should be a spread instead. Okay, so your choice of the strategy when volatility is low, all right, should be what we call put spread instead. All right, why a put spread? Because first, usually volatility is low when prices have already rebounded. All right, so when prices have rebounded, yet, yet, with constant worries about, you know, profitabilities of the company, because most companies who have lost a lot of income over the last couple of months, all right, so are they going to, you know, start dishing out much better than expected earnings? If the answer is no, then, you know, you may have to be prepared that, you know, all the counters may perform what we call a correction move. So a correction move, when it comes, all right, what do you want? All right, you don't want to hold on to those stocks, all right, but possibly you want to set what we call a maximum loss limit, all right, on, you know, a transaction that you're taking on or a trade that you're taking on. So in this case, you know, the spread would allow you to achieve that. Right? So that's, you know, something that you can decide or play around with over here when you're actually building a particular portfolio, all right, around selling options, okay? And more so if, you know, you're building a portfolio which is now sizable enough, okay? All right, now, so, you know, I just hope I added, you know, a little bit of context over here in terms of volatility and, you know, the right strategies to be adopting over here, okay? Sorry to steal the thunder, Jeremy. All right, that's all I wanted to share over here. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, I mean, well, you, you shared a very great example. I think what happened to, during the period of time when we were discussing, I can't recall, was it with you or was it within the community? We actually took a trade whereby there was this internal joke whereby we hope that the trade actually goes wrong. And then we will actually be able yeah. to buy MGM at about $3 a stock. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. It, it was kind of one of those stocks, the, 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 the trades that, 
I kind of wish I, I could have had more, but uh, when you want to do a portfolio trading, you have to manage the risk. Yeah, but it was one of those that I, it paid very well in terms of the time frame, the return, the overall profile. Yeah, so um, while we didn't really identify the trade using IV, at least I didn't, but uh, looking at it is actually one of those cases whereby on hindsight, IV actually allow us to actually pay off, to take a very good payoff of the, the, the trade. Yeah. Yes. So, you know, like I said earlier, IV should not be the only thing you look at when you're thinking about, for example, selling options. But, you know, IV can help you in part of making your decision whether, you know, uh, what strategy should I adopt right now or, you know, what uh, kind of choices should I make right now. Yeah. Okay. So that's actually how volatility, you know, inflating the prices of option premiums can actually help in this context. Okay. Right now, so uh, last part over here. Any questions for anyone? Okay, any questions for er anyone over here? All right now, I see a question over here. Um, just a quick one. Uh, how can we sell options over here from high price stocks? Uh, okay, now, so I think this question is basically, uh, how can we sell options for higher price stocks over here? Uh, one, all right, uh, Jeremy, you can check me with your answer after I'm done, okay? All right. Sure. Now, one, basically, I feel that uh, purely because the stocks are higher priced, uh, even if you're doing it from a trading perspective, all right, uh, it will make more sense to do it in the form of a spread. Okay, uh, Why? Because first, you get to limit your losses. right, And second, obviously, with a spread, uh, you get to do it with much uh, lesser margin as well, uh, with lower capital base as well. But, uh, you know, if you want to first sell options on higher price stocks, you have to be very aware that higher price stocks expect much higher price movements as well, right? So, you know, have that in mind before you make a decision, right? Why do I say this? Because uh, in one of my services over here, we actually, sold, we actually sold a call spread on Tesla, right? We actually sold a call spread on Tesla and we were date wrong. Right, we were like totally wrong. We had like a call strike that was uh, sitting around three hundred dollars level, and we we you know we saw we saw Tesla went from like three hundred dollars all the way to nine hundred dollars, right in that trade, right in that trade. Now, can you imagine if that was actually a naked, right? If that was a naked, it would have bankrupt anyone. Yeah. Okay. All right. And you have been caught in no man's land because trust me, if a stock that's moving up so fast over here, you'll probably be telling yourself, maybe I should try closing it tomorrow. Maybe tomorrow. Maybe tomorrow. Maybe tomorrow. But tomorrow, every tomorrow, just makes the stock price jump another hundred dollars. All right. So you know, it, it's it's a balance between when you are losing, it's very hard to make the decision to cut. All right. So why not you know do it via a spread over here? Where you know, even if it jumps out of the gate, all right, you already know where you're gonna be cut off, all right? Because if you do a one dollar spread, then you know you have kept your losses at one dollar. If you do a five dollar spread, you kept your losses at five dollars, right? So I think for that trade, we kept our losses at like five dollars. So you know, when Tesla jumped out by a hundred dollars, we were already wrong. So there was nothing much we could do, all right? So because we have kept our losses, we were able to wait. And we sold an option that lasted about, I think, one or two months, right? <laughs> and the weird thing was, you know, the coronavirus happened during that period. So it brought Tesla all the way from 900 back to 300 <laughs> in a couple of days. So to, to our surprise that, you know, that call spread actually, you know, turned profitable, right? You know, it was a kind of like a hopeless trade with like two weeks to go, but it actually became profitable, right? All I'm trying to highlight over here is the fact that, you know, when you're trading expensive stuff, you first, you better know what you're doing. Second, you better know what uh, the stock is capable of doing in terms of how it moves. Okay, and uh, you know, lastly, I think it always makes a lot more sense to do it via a spread. Yes, it may decrease the profitability of the trade itself, but uh, you know, it definitely increases the security or the safety behind it. Yeah, so, and in our guideline as option sellers, we always view uh, risk first. That means we make sure we protect our risk before we go after the profits that we want to make. All right. Hmm. So Jeremy, anything to add on? I think if it was up to me, I would actually approach this question from a different perspective. Uh, mm -hmm. It's going to sound very similar to what you share, but rather than ask the question, how? I think the question I always ask myself is what? what will happen if I am absolutely wrong? How, uh, what is the damage in terms of per trade that 
I will suffer. So when I get that, that, that central core understanding, that requirement in my mind whenever I structure any trade, um, whenever I structure any trade, this for some of you guys, you know me, I'm actually managing my family's retirement portfolio. So that way, right, actually it allows me to sleep well at night. And I don't really have to be uh, monitoring the markets until like 4 a.m., 3 a.m., three hours of the morning. And more often than not, for some of you guys who know me, I'm actually out for supper, for tea, uh, during trading hours. Because the, the, the specs that what Sharon share, right, emphasizes, it gives you this, this room for you to breathe. If I'm absolutely wrong, I have kept my losses. But if I'm right, and I, I've done, taken my trade, uh, my trade space on my strategy, so I can be rewarded if I am not wrong, but if I'm wrong, I know how much will I be done. Yeah. Okay. All right. Now, so uh, I hope that you know solves uh, the question that you have, Kenny. And I think that's also all the questions that we have for tonight's session over here. Uh, Jeremy, could you just flash the PowerPoint again to highlight uh, what's tomorrow's topic? Sure. Give me a second. Yeah. All right. Thank you. All right, so uh, for those of you who are still with us right now, at the moment, uh, it's not shared yet. Uh, okay, there it's coming up, I think. Yeah, there we go. Okay, now, so uh, for those of you who are still with us right now, uh, if you have not done so, help us to share the videos out. If you find that what we shared today is useful to you, right, that means it'll probably be useful to you know anyone that uh, you share it out to as well. Now, uh, also tomorrow will be day 25, all right, of our Project Options cash flow. And what I'm going to do is I'm done with the options language. So tomorrow, I'm going to do something interesting, right? Tomorrow, I'm going to do something of what I call the upsellers option. That means if you're selling options over here, but you want to be able to also create much higher possible returns, okay? That means when you're right, you want to create higher returns from an option selling trade, okay? Tomorrow, I'm going to discuss a strategy that allows you to do that. Okay, now, so tomorrow I'm going to show you how you can sell options and yet create returns that could potentially be in the range of like 60%, 100%, 200% even, all right? Of course, that would depend on the magnitude of the stock move. But, okay, you are no longer capped to just the premiums you collect from selling options. So tomorrow, that will be my topic over here. So do make sure you stay tuned with us, all right? Tomorrow, I'm going to cover that strategy over here, which is going to be exciting if you're an option seller right now today. Okay, so thank you very much for joining us in this session. All right, thank you, Jeremy, for your time as well. I hope yeah, all of you enjoyed Jeremy's session over here. All right, uh, I'll see all of you tomorrow, same time, same channel at 9 p.m. GMT plus 8 Singapore time, okay? All right, bye-bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye Good night. Good night. Bye.